Welcome to Barn Blog Solo. And today I'm talking about the rational kernel of truth behind the PMC debates and why the bourgeoisie seems so absent from our discussion. See, we talk about capitalism on the left all the time. We don't talk about capitalist. Yes, occasionally people will get mad about the tech uh, billionaires that make up the top of the Forbes 500 list without noting that none of those tech billionaires, not even Bill Gates, are in the richest families. The reasons for this are complicated, but not as complicated as you seem as it seems. Family wealth and the development of our power families in the bourgeoisie has happened over the course of two centuries. According to Forbes, the richest families are known. We know who they are. The Waltons, the Cox, the Mars family, the Cargill Macmillan family, the Larder family, the Johnson family, the Edward Johnson family, the Duncan family, the Hearst family, the Prisker family. And if you think all those names sound like they're from an older economy, from the Fordist period, as opposed to the robber baron periods, like we're not talking about the Carnegies and the, and the Rockefellers anymore, you'd be correct. Now, what does this have to do with the PMC debates? What does this have to do with the fact that bourgeoisie seems to be nowhere and why, we, why the left doesn't know how to target a specific bourgeoisie? Why don't we talk about who these people are and their ties to, to every gross thing we can think of from Epstein to all these um, tech scams that, that developed over the last decade that even affected our top politicians? And why aren't any of these families implicated in that? See, the rational kernel of the PMC debates is that the is that the bourgeoisie itself does not manage its industry anymore. Since the 1980s, most of these families have stepped away from even direct management of the corporations in which they own. It's not true for every one of them, but it's true for most of them. And the giants of retail and manufacturing are the source of these families. But if they're not around and we don't see them and we don't work for them directly because they're living off of investments now, not even investments in productive assets, which is traditionally true, investments in speculative assets. Now, the difference between productive and speculative assets is, is, is subjective. It's one of debate. But productive assets tend to reinvest in infrastructure and manufacturing and maintaining of material goods. Speculative assets don't. They're based off hedging the price of something now versus the price of something in the future. Now, the heyday of venture capital and all these tech firms doing what they've done was based under there being a lot of debt encouraging Kind uh, venture investments. Why would capitalists do a lot of venture investment? If you're a new capitalist and you want to not have income, so you can't get taxed on it, or uh, and you get taxed on lower capital gains, well, one thing you can do is just heavily, heavily debt leverage yourself so you don't have that income. You subtract it from your from your overall bottom line. And then you try to build profits off of the cost of the debt being lower than the cost of your investments in venture capital, even if they're not particularly safe or smart. So these large families have highly diversified investment now. They're not as tied into the current economy, but they don't need to be. They've accumulated wealth. By the way, when people talk about like the racial wealth gap, a lot of these families are where it actually comes from. If you control for, for the top 1% of wealth, there is still a racial wealth gap, but it is dramatically smaller. And most of that has to do with home ownership. So the PMC debates are interesting. The problem with the PMC 
is that when Barbara and John Aaron Wright conceived of it, it was conceived at, at a time of a Fordist economy where people were entering in to education to be elites in business, academia, or the military. And the military, by the way, is still where all the generalists and stuff mostly are. In fact, they're not even in academia anymore. If you want a generalist scientist, where are they likely to be? In the military, working for DARPA. Bring all this up because it tells you a bunch of things about why things are the way they are right now. You're often looking at the individual recent income billionaires, but not at the long accumulation of wealth. And when people do look at wealth, they tend to look at it on racial aggregates, not divided by class and who makes up those classes and how they got there. But it also explains why the capitalists seem to be so absent from politics, why politics is increasingly a middle tier or managerial and professional affair. Professionals can amass quite a bit of wealth, but nothing like the kind of wealth that the bourgeoisie can. Think in the terms of hundreds of thousands, maybe the lower millions, but never, never much more than that. I think of many comedians and whatnot, or even left, even certain liberal uh, political figures who are millionaires, but they are not billionaires. So this leads the management of society to the elite of the professional and managerial strata. Some of the professionals are petit bourgeois, but rely on government contracts and rents. Petit bourgeois that rely on selling commodities or traditional retail have much lower profit margins right now. They come in the poorer parts of the country and the poorer parts of the world. They tend to be more conservative because tax margins actually hurt them. Michael Lind talks about this in The New Class War. And this manifests in what Phil Neal talks about in The Hinterlands, a core and periphery within the United States. So when people respond to the PMC and they're not just using it as a catch-all to blame elites, a.k.a. people they don't like, or try to put try to re return an image of the productive working class of the 1950s, which is only 14 to 17 percent of the population at most. And if you're dealing with the public sector of that, it's more like 10. And even as we reshore and start to reindustrialize parts of the United States, I promise you, because of automation, digitization, etc., and just general efficiency. You will not return to the Fordist style mega corporations within an industrial shop floor that you saw in the 50s, 60s, and the, in the 70s. That time will not come back. So we talk about capitalism because we don't know who the capitalists are. And we talk about the PMC because we have trouble figuring out who the elite are. We know that they're curtailed and credentialed. Most of the time, except in the military, it's where a lot of those credentializations are internal and you don't know them. And in fact, the military is kind of the secret Caesar to all of this because it is where a whole lot of development and management comes from, but it's hidden from the public view. And when liberals and conservatives discuss society, they don't deal with the with the public sector, of the military, except to complain about how the military may be woke without dealing with why it would have such incentives to be so. The PMC thesis is a thesis I still don't accept because it's vague. But the reality is that the bourgeoisie isn't fulfilling its historical mission because the bourgeoisie doesn't need to invest in productive industry to continue maintaining its wealth. And it's finding new ways to hoard that money in speculation because the profit margins and traditional ways of producing Commodities is low. I find this increasingly frustrating because asserting this has been fought back by the left itself, who wants to believe in monetary theories, making such theories of profitability irrelevant. The currency flows 
are what matters. And currency flows specifically in currency to pay taxes, as if an economy is a closed system. Now, there are many truths that come out of monetary theory, but this is not one of them. And almost all their models are based on the closet model of the, of the German historicist Knapp. I'm going to talk a lot about the German historicist school and nailing it down, because I think a lot of people don't really understand the reductions of current political and economic theories coming from this time period that are showing back up. They're cleaned up. They seem new. They correspond with part of what you're seeing right now, but not other parts of it, and people don't question that. Yes, Virginia, there is a managerial elite and a professional elite. My big complaint about, say, Catherine Lewis' PMC theory, it's not that Catherine Lewis is totally wrong about what she's describing. I think her cultural description of elites and virtue hoarding is absolutely true. And I think the collapse of the administrative, the neutral administrative liberalism, um, which really collapsed from a mixture of 9-11 and the, and the geopolitical project of that administrative state reaching an, a crescendo in the ways most people can't deny. I mean, literally, only centrist are the people who avoid talking about American empire now. And almost nobody will deny that it exists. Whereas when I was in college, no professor that I talked to, even some left-wing ones, would admit that America was an empire. Now, this is even a liberal assumption. It's always been true that the foundation of our of, of the continental project is an imperial one. Settler, colonial, and then imperial outright. But just naming that doesn't just actually tell you as much as you think. In fact, if anything, the left has a problem from the PMC debates to a ton of other debates of giving something a name and thinking that name explains how something happens. Well, this is settler colonialism. Well, settler colonialism describes a thing. It's a shorthand where we use for description. But what's in that description and how it works is how we actually know things. So I've been softer and softer on the on the PMC critics, not because I think their class framework is, is right. I've told you, I think that most of the PMC debates end up in cul-de-sacs where they can't figure out when they're talking about actual elites or just anyone with a college degree because there's they can't come up with a clear criterion that meets one standard. And fine. And they also don't deal with the division of this labor. Are teachers and nurses PMC? Well, Unlike other professionals, they, they are paid well, but not paid to keep up with inflation. They're in the top 50% of income earners. But also, they're not jobs that anyone really wants to do unless they have to. And it's seen as a formerly industrial class way, or working class, or even semi-lumpenized poor, precarious people, to get stability, and that's it. Now, how many single moms in the 80s and 90s became nurses because... It was a stable job. I know my mom did. Better than being a waitress, right? Furthermore, the current focus on unionizations that the left is obsessed with are all, with the exception of the Amazon workers, in transitory unions. Things that are temporary. Service sector jobs that people don't stay in for a long time. And have never been highly unionized for that reason. And they've used this to not look at the failure of unions in other places. But let's call things what they are. It's because the left is uncomfortable calling out oligarchies of which it sees itself as entering. See, the rational kernel of the PMC basis is that the iron law of oligarchy is very much in operation right now. Yes, it's not an iron law. Yes, there are ways around it. But we are not doing those things. And since we are not doing them, we have elite capture or minority capture. And by minority, I don't mean like by minority groups like races or anything. I just mean by a small group of people in the organization across the board. You can think of this in the NGOization of politics. That is a perfect way to set up a bureaucracy and a bureaucracy will set up an oligarchy. This is what I was talking about way back in the past about why you need to systematize as a to, to bureaucracy. But that is why the PMC thesis 
seemingly coming out of nowhere, even though it's been around since the 1960s, no one talked about it from like the 1980s to the to the end of the 2000s, except for people like Adolf Reed, because it wasn't so obvious at the time. Plus, it was clear that like management and educated professionals and the petit bourgeois often have different interests. And they still have different interests, but now those interests are regional more than they are sectional, which completely changes a lot of the calculus. Now, I'm going to list uh, the Forbes article that I cite here. Um, the rest of this is my own thought. But remember, these families have accumulated wealth and are invested in a way that they no longer have to run things. So when we talk about capitalism, we wonder where the bourgeoisie is actually at. And who do we see? We see the managers. We see the professors, etc. What we need to start asking ourselves is what is the real interest of these groups? Why is it that this that the quote PMC itself seems to be at odds with itself? And also, why are people who meet the educational criteria that most people set up for the PMC seemingly being proletarianized where other parts of it aren't? And why is it that none of these people seem competent anymore? They're specialized. They know special skills. These are not stupid people. If your answer to any political question is that everyone is dumb, that is, to flat, that is generally flattering your own ego. Americans love this shit. I know so many people who just go, like, oh, Americans are dumb and fat. Why? Why do you flatter your ego this way? It makes sense why Europeans would flatter their ego this way. I know many people when I lived in Latin America who hated the American government but didn't think such negative things about Americans the way Americans themselves do. What are the incentives to do that? What is the incentive towards self-flattery? What is unhappy making? So yes, I still don't believe in the PMC thesis, but I do think people glom onto it because part of it describes something real. There's other parts of it that are real too. I talked about academic discipline and and how it changes the way people act as political subjects, and how it breaks down the way people are willing to approach problems, and how it cordons away things that require interdisciplinary thought. Even though interdisciplinarity is popular, even in academia, it's hard to make a career out of it. And there's usually only one or two people who can in any given field and time. But I want you to start thinking about wealth being structuralized and what that means in a real and direct way. Why we need, why just come bitching about the PMC isn't good enough. We need to ask ourselves who is managing the society and why are they managing managing it and why are the economic elites, the actual bourgeoisie. The true wealth holders of our society, why do they seem so absent? And why can't we predict their politics anymore? Think about it. It's important to understand if you want to have a coherent view of what is going on.